This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TVMALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. We tell our clients up front, it's usually not a ghost. She locked eyes with me, but something was wrong. My reflection, that's not what I was wearing. That wasn't me in the glass. And they're not hiring us to find a ghost. They're hiring us to solve a problem. And we usually do. She didn't have arms or legs. She was hovering there. She was giving me a look that wanted me to come closer. All the hairs on my body stood on end. Liam climbed in the trunk and closed himself inside. But it's never a ghost. You'll never survive the winter. Well, almost never. Welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott. First, I would like to thank those of you who have already taken the time to write me such incredibly kind and encouraging messages about my new show. If you don't follow me on social media, then let me just tell you the cat is finally out of the bag. The show I have been teasing for so long is finally here. It's a ParCast slash Spotify original called Mediums. It's a true, it's, it's not fiction this time. I'm turning in a new direction. This is all true. It's all about the spiritualist movement of the late 19th and early 20th century. And don't worry, I'm going to have a much more formal introduction for you all. I have something special for you. You know that, but that is coming soon. But I just wanted to put it out there that it is up already. You can go check out the trailer and the first two episodes. It will be coming out every Wednesday. Um, Please go listen. Let me know how you like it. I'm so proud of it. Seriously, I'm just over the moon about it. Again, we'll talk more about that later. Speaking of great shows, though, I also wanted to talk to you about another show that I've been absolutely binging lately called Margaret's Garden. So much so that when I was recently talking to a friend of mine over at Bloody Disgusting, you all know Bloody Disgusting, I specifically asked to promote Margaret's Garden on my show. You can ask him. (laughs) Basically, it's about this American suburb called Everton, that it's like the perfect mid-century Americana postcard. Then, out of nowhere, every single person vanishes. The show takes place 70 years later, when two federal agents start digging into what exactly happened to Everton. It's cookie-cutter houses, conspiracies, and cosmonauts all waiting for you in Margaret's Garden. You can find it on Spotify or wherever you listen to podcasts, but we know right now you're listening to Spotify. And if you'd like more information, you can go to margaretspodcast.com. Okay. Now on with the show. This story comes from an author who is new to the show, so welcome him. Charles Wellman. Tonight, Charles has for us, Claret.
The carriage creaked back and forth as it slowly crawled up the windy, snow-covered avenue leading up to the estate. Normally, this kind of turbulence would have rendered me devastatingly bilious, but the recent voyage across the English Channel makes this short and final leg of the journey seem pleasant by comparison. The inside of the coach was illuminated by the reflection of bright white snow off the vast, empty fields on either side of the road. Gold tassels hanging from the burgundy damask curtains swung like censers in front of my face, which did not do much to ease the tensions on my tired stomach. At last, the coach arrived at the impressive mansion belonging to my great-aunt Amelia. I had spent the last six months at the University of Paris, studying classics, art history, and literature, and I have graciously agreed to take inventory of my great-aunt's extensive library collection and help appraise any additions which may be of high value. This agreement is convenient for me, since I will forego the full trip home to Wales while still spending time in southern England where the participants of conversation are not held hostage by my sluggish recitation of French before my studies resume in a few weeks and I return to Paris. I have not been to the Carlisle estate since I was very young, but things do not seem to have changed much if my memory serves me correctly. After a painful journey, the swaying carriage came to a halt as the magnificent building came into view. I gazed out of my coach window. The front of the house is adorned with a classical colonnade, supporting a large pediment flanked by large wings on either side. Decorative claret jugs adorn the tympanum and the roofline, the only notable ornamentation. The house is impressive, yet imposing lacking in elegance typically seen in English country houses. I disembarked and trudged my way through thick snow. Clearly, no one had entered or left the mansion through the front door recently, judging by the copious amounts of undisturbed snow built up on and around the stairs. I arrived at the colossal bronze doors and swung the large brass knocker three times. A tall, graying man answered. Good afternoon, I greeted the man. I'm Lou... Before I could finish my introduction, the man uncouthly interrupted me. Yes, I know who you are. Please follow me. Surprised by the rudeness and lack of any semblance of conversation, I grabbed my bags and followed the gaunt man through a large reception room, adorned with gilded mirrors and marble statues. We walked up a mahogany staircase and down a long corridor, with the walls covered in oil-painted portraits of people one could assume were long dead. One would certainly agree that where the exterior lacked in decoration, the interior made up for in extravagance. The man, who I assumed to be the butler, led me into a room decorated lavishly in green. Lady Carlyle will be in the drawing room at three o'clock, the frightful butler said while turning away. The hospitality was at its nadir here, but it is far more desirable than my apartment in Paris. I looked at the gold clock perched on the marble mantel. It read quarter past one. I still had some time to repose before being received by my hostess. I laid back in a plush green chaise lounge by the tall window. I stared at the silk green curtains as the ticking of the mantel clock lulled me to a light slumber. I awoke with a sudden jolt as the clock chimed 1.30. As I looked around the room, I felt a sudden sensation of extreme claustrophobia, one that I have never felt before. The room fell dark 
despite the windows being fully uncovered and the sky was cloudless. Was I still in a dream state? The intense feeling of melancholy that washed over me was almost too much to bear. As if these sensations were not enough, the odor suddenly struck my nose. It was the smell one could only describe as putrid wine. Rotting tannins mixed with a sour vinegar and what I could only describe as death. I quickly arose from my chaise and rushed to the chamber door in an attempt to escape the oppressive space. Before I could reach the door, I heard a gentle knocking. The room suddenly grew brighter, and the air lighter, and... I could not tell if the smell had fully gone away, or... My nose was in a state of shock. I took a moment or two to collect myself before I creaked open the old walnut door. Standing before me was a small young woman, no older than twenty. She had soft features, deep brunette hair, and wore a maroon walking dress. My apologies if I'm disturbing you, but I thought I would make certain you were well accommodated. Silas is not one to make guests feel particularly welcome, she stated. Still in a daze and likely looking as green as my decorated bedroom, it took me another moment to realize who the small young woman was talking about. Oh, yes. Thank you, madam. I replied. Silas was most accommodating and made me feel right at home. I assumed Silas was the skeletal man who emphatically did not make me feel at home, but I did not want to speak ill of anyone under Aunt Amelia's employ. I haven't spoken with her in two decades, but from what I can remember, she was not a person of whom you would want to make a cross. The woman gave me a look indicating she knew I was lying. I am Cornelia Carlyle, Lady Carlyle's granddaughter. I thought I would make my introductions now before tea in the drawing room. Granny loves nothing more than to sit in melancholic silence, which makes good conversation rather strenuous. Thank you, Miss Carlyle, I replied, realizing that I have still not formally introduced myself to anyone since arriving. I'm Llewellyn Hughes, Lady Carlyle's great nephew, as I am sure you already knew. It's a pleasure to meet you. Won't you join me in the library? It's quite warm in there, since Granny keeps the fire going in that room most of the day. It was only then that I noticed how desperately cold the emerald green room was. I didn't remember it being so frigid when I first arrived. That would be lovely, madam, I said, eager to get away from the oppressive atmosphere of the green bedroom and to get acquainted with the multitude of volumes that I will be spending most of my time at the estate with. Cornelia led me down the same long hallway as I had entered and down the same grand staircase into the reception room. As we passed the gilt mirrors, I caught a glimpse of my disheveled appearance. Had I really slept so restlessly for so short a time? I looked as though I had been asleep for days. I was pale, with dark circles, unkempt hair, and glassy, red eyes. I felt embarrassed to look so uncouth in the presence of my immaculately dressed second cousin. As I continued to follow Cornelia through the room, I thought I caught a glimpse of someone watching me through the mirror. It was only for a fraction of a second before it slipped away. The slight image of... a woman. I had assumed the mirror had simply caught the reflection of one of the various portraits hanging on the wall in which we passed. I quickly caught up with Cornelia. We passed through a set of brilliantly ornate walnut doors and into a massive room with books filling mahogany shelves from floor to ceiling. The enormous windows on either side of the room were dressed in burgundy damask curtains, dressed with gold tassels. 
I chuckled to myself, imagining that the leftover trimmings of the library were used to decorate the rickety carriage I had been delivered in. A massive marble fireplace, which I assume was once white, was now black with soot, roared with a fire that warmed the entire space. The warmth of the room was offset by the Goliath portrait above the mantel. A cold gaze belonging to a man in a powdered wig and an armchair watched me intently and was enough to chill a viewer to the bone. Percival, Carlyle, Cornelia remarked, startling me and breaking my gaze with the stoic visage. He built this house 160 years ago, but the property has remained the seat of the Carlyle family since the Norman Conquest. Lord Carlyle also founded the estate winery shortly after the house was finished in 1735. Winery? I, I did not remember there being a winery on the estate, I retorted, perplexed. Granny halted all wine production about 40 years ago. It is interesting that she should discontinue winemaking in this area. Fertile soil for grapes is difficult to come by in southern England, I remarked. She replied, It is uncommon, especially soil that is well suitable for a good claret. Claret? That is astonishing that this estate so close to the salty English Channel would support the grapes for claret. Cornelia paused, as if seriously considering what she is about to say next. There is a legend that I remember hearing as a girl, but I do not give much credence to it. She paused again, running her fingers over a stack of neglected texts, bound in leather and covered in a layer of dust. As I mentioned before, this estate has been in the family since the Norman Conquest. Part of William the Conqueror's fleet landed on the shores near where the estate now stands. The ensuing battle is rarely spoken about in literature, since the bulk of the invasion began in Pevensey. But... She paused again, seeming to regret telling this story. The battle is considered one of the bloodiest battles on English soil, at least by county locals. It is said that there was so much blood soaked in the earth that it fertilized the soil, allowing grapes that would typically not grow north of France to be supported. Cornelia's fearful expression gave away the fact that she really believed this tale, whether she wanted to or not. I remained respectful of her story despite the fact that I did not believe a word of it. How could the bloodiest battle on English soil go undocumented, and the bodies of soldiers alone would not be enough to support grapes centuries later? I tried to change the subject. So, why did Lady Carlyle stop the wine production? Granny stopped production after Lord Carlyle died, and... Her daughter, Madeline, went missing. Do not mention the winery or the reasons why she put an end to it, though. She will not speak of it, and it upsets her. I nodded in agreement and in empathy for the poor old woman. I did not realize that she even had a daughter. I only vaguely knew of your father and his older brother. It is a mystery that continues to perplex us but we do not investigate it any further as we prefer to keep the wounds as closed as we can and not reopen them. I doubt my grandmother would have relayed this to you as she does not speak of the tragedies that have befallen her, but her son, the current Lord Carlyle, left the estate years ago to live in London and has taken permanent residence there, refusing to return to the estate. As for my father, he passed away when I was very young, along with my mother in a hunting accident. Granny has since raised me here. I admit, I never knew my great aunt's life was filled with such tragedy, yet it seems to justify her cold demeanor. We only talked recently through correspondence, but her tone in the letters seemed desperately melancholic. 
Cornelia and I talked more about Amelia's life, the history of the house, and how much work I have before me. Soon, the grandfather clock nestled in between the curtains, chimed three o'clock. <sighs> Tea time, Cornelia said with a sigh. She rose slowly from the burgundy armchair that she had been sitting in. She led me again through the magnificent doors that divide the library from the wide corridor leading to the reception room. Again, I crossed the large reception room, this time avoiding looking into the mirrors. We came to a set of much more modest doors, white with gold ornamentation. The doors opened with a creak, and sitting in a crimson armchair was a stoic old woman. She wore a large black dress, resembling something Queen Victoria would be seen wearing. She truly did look like a queen, especially in comparison with Silas standing behind her. Clearly a product of an aristocratic upbringing, she wore a tight corset and a very pronounced bustle, more in tune with the fashion a decade ago, rather than the mid-1890s. She wore little jewelry aside from a large sapphire brooch resting on her lapel. Cornelia, dear, it is indecorous to be alone with a young man about the house. The grand lady spoke. My apologies, Granny. I wanted to make sure Cousin Llewellyn was well accommodated. Cornelia retorted. We have Silas for that, dear. Please, sit. She gestured to both of us to sit in two matching crimson armchairs across from her. I attempted to make light conversation. Thank you for welcoming me into your home, Aunt Amelia. I look forward to spending time in your impressive library. She stared at me with a scrutinizing glance. Yes, dear. Be gentle with my volumes. She paused to bring the antique teacup to her lips. Do not enter the study off of the library. She remarked before the cup could make contact. Cornelia was correct in her assessment that her aunt is not a conversationalist, as the rest of the tea was uncomfortably silent. The next morning, I got straight to rifling through the stacks of books in the Grand Library. I had slept surprisingly well in my lavish emerald room, and had no incident which had disturbed me the previous day. Many of the books that I had come across were by unfamiliar authors regarding biographies, autobiographies, and historical accounts of the local land. Of course, none mentioned a gruesome battle taking place on the very land which the estate stood. I found myself somewhat disappointed in not validating a single anecdote recited by my second cousin but I could not waste time searching for an answer to a fictitious claim which likely does not exist. I organized the text according to type, biography, autobiography, geography, history, etc. Then I moved on to a more exciting stack of dusty parchment. Writings by Sir Edward Coke and Walter Badgett. What these two antique writings had in common, I could not tell you, besides the fact that the combined value could feed a village for five years. The dust from the stacks was irritating my throat and lungs. The crack of the fireplace was intermittently interrupted by my coughing as I tried to purge the ancient dust from my dry throat. I worked on through the dusty haze until the clock on the oak sideboard struck 1.30. For some odd reason, I felt compelled to look up. There, I saw her again. Surely this was no mere reflection or light playing tricks. In the bottom left corner of the large window was a woman staring at me, her eyes yellow and sad, her skin pale and her hair a beautiful brown but in a fashion that appeared to be long outdated. 
but it was disheveled. As quickly as I saw her, she was gone, and the room, which was lit by natural light, went dark. The roaring fire, which had been lit only an hour ago, grew dim, and the room was frightfully cold. The overwhelming feeling of tightness came over me like a dark cloud, and the air was oppressively thick. The smell again. The hideous odor battered my senses again. I was transfixed with fear, desperate to escape the grand library, which now felt like a coffin, with which I shared a long, expired corpse. I broke from my paralysis and bolted to the door, unknowingly passing through the door which I had not entered the library originally. It was a door that I had never passed through, nor had taken notice of before. I quickly passed through the threshold and slammed the old door behind me, taking a moment to catch my breath. The air in the room was much more palatable, and the atmosphere was light. The new room which I had entered was small and cozy. A couple bookshelves lined the far wall. A large carved partner desk sat in the middle of the room, and a delicate brass chandelier hung in the center of the ornately embellished plaster ceiling. The thought dawned on me that this is the study which Aunt Amelia expressly forbade me from entering. I knew I should not be in this room as it was disrespectful to my hostess to go against her wishes. However, I refuse to go back through the library again and face whatever demons lurk among the shadows. I resolved to remain in the study despite my better manners. There were a couple of armchairs against the wall, next to a bookshelf, so I sat in one while I mustered the courage to make my exodus, whenever that would be. After quite some time, I was still rattled with anxiety, so I decided to participate in some light reading to pass the time. As my eyes glossed over the bound manuscripts on the shelves, I came to the realization that these books were not the same type of books in the main library. The books in the library were more... genteel, I suppose would be the proper adjective, compared to the books in the study. These books were roughly constructed and disorganized in a way that was... unsettling. As if the person who uses the study was... Unhinged. The thought seemed ridiculous. I am assuming Aunt Amelia uses the study, but the last word I would use to describe her is unhinged. My eye caught a large book bound in leather. It was visually attractive, so it was the first book I plucked from the shelf. Neither the cover nor the spine gave any indication of what the contents of the book held. Upon opening it, it became clear that it was a ledger from when the estate operated as a winery. It documented in rather beautiful handwriting the estate's wine sales. The earliest sale in this ledger was 60 years ago, in 1835. It was six barrels of claret, sold to the Duke of Wellington. After flipping through the pages, I noticed the Duke bought another 33 barrels in 1838 alone. I chuckled, imagining the grand old duke under the table at the coronation. As I flipped the dusty pages, I made a more unsettling observation. The beautiful handwriting began to grow, sporadic, as if written with an anxious fervor. By the end of the book, the handwriting was barely legible. I would dismiss this as the author displaying aging or the progression of a disease affecting motor function. However, this particular script struck an inescapable fear. I set the book down and moved away from the shelf. My knees began to tremble and I still felt dazed, so I took a rest behind the partner desk in the middle of the room. Again. I felt a bit indecorous, snooping around where Aunt Amelia told me not to. However, my curiosity was piqued. My eyes glanced over some handwritten correspondence laying on top of the desk. It was between Lady Amelia Carlyle and a Sarah W. 
from California, United States. At this point, all courtesy had evaporated, and I began to pore over the pages of correspondence. The conversations documented were horrifying, despondent, occult. One read as follows. My dear lady, I remain increasingly troubled by the great matter you are faced. To have one's own child snatched from you is so egregious a tragedy as to render one in an absolute state of desolation. I do not presume that your daughter has met an unmentionable fate. However, should the worst be true, I am well acquainted with methods of resuming contact. The letter continues to document macabre acts of attempting to speak with the deceased. I will spare the gruesome details of this letter's sinful contents. What was more intriguing was the papers from Scotland Yard atop the desk, dated 1855. The stack of papers was a report documenting the investigation behind the loss of Aunt Amelia's daughter, Madeline Carlyle. The report kept mentioning a man named William Vanvert. Upon closer reading, I discovered Mr. Vanvert was the head vintner of the estate. In conclusion of this report, William Vanvert, a resident of the estate of the Carlyles, had access to all persons and property on the estate. Witness testimony of estate staff indicated that Vanvert showed particular interest in the decedent missing party. Both were seen together on the ground of the estate, engaging in activities unbecoming of the status and class of a member of the Carlyle family. Redacted from the court records is the oral testimony that some staff believed Madeline Carlyle was in a delicate condition. She was unmarried. This redaction came as the result of a motion brought by Lady Amelia Carlyle. Other staff who worked with Vanvert testified to his state of mind around the disappearance. The testimonies are highly varied, but the underlying conclusion was Vanvert was not of sound mind, and this mental decay had been manifesting over the course of years. Vanvert was displaying violent tendencies. On one occasion, he nearly drowned a young apprentice, aged 11, in an opened barrel of unaged wine as punishment for accidentally breaking a bottle of the estate's claret. No charges were brought. The court determined Vanvert to be insane and unable to stand trial for the disappearance of Madame Carlyle. The court subsequently ordered William Vanvert to be sent to an asylum where he will stay for the remainder of his natural life. I felt bilious upon reading the correspondence and the report. It took everything in me not to stand up and run out of the house and away from the estate. The sorrow of my Aunt Amelia was clear. Her head vintner went insane and was suspected of causing the disappearance of her daughter. Worse still, I think my aunt may be dabbling in... The occult. I could feel the blood from my face drain as I came to the realization that the feminine apparition which I have seen in the house confirms my aunt's ill-advised communications with spirits from the beyond. I heard footsteps coming from outside the study. I had no idea if the steps belonged to someone alive or dead. But perhaps the former prospect was more terrifying. Believe me when I tell you the thought of meeting my aunt on the opposite side of that door was less appealing than coming face to face with a wraith brought to fruition by the estate's sordid past. The doorknob turned slowly and the door creaked open. I thought I lost consciousness because the next thing I saw was Cornelia's face looking down on me with a look of consternation. "'What are you doing in here?' she said sharply. I was laying on the ground. My head felt empty. "'Granny made it clear you were not permitted in here. Did you touch anything?' I sat up. 
still foggy. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't... I didn't even try to come up with an excuse. I was still trying to process my very recent revelations. I got up to my feet. I was not worried that Cornelia would tell Aunt Amelia, because she had no interest in upsetting her grandmother. I am leaving now. You do not have to worry about me entering the study again. I walked out of the room without saying another word. That was the last time I was at the estate. I left the house that night and got a room at the local tavern, refusing to stay another minute. I would depart for Paris the next day. I wrote to Aunt Amelia apologizing for my departure, citing some emergency at home requiring my attention. I hadn't thought about the estate for quite some time after that incident. About a year later, I received a letter from Cornelia. The letter indicated that Aunt Amelia had died. I regret to admit that that was not the clause in the letter that upset me. What upset me was the invitation to come back to the estate for the reading of the will. The letter did not indicate any emotions of hostility, so I was under the impression that my transgressions had been forgiven. I resolved to travel back to the estate, but I refused to stay the night. I managed to get a room at the same tavern I stayed in a year prior. This time, when sitting at the pub, I noticed a bottle of Carlisle Claret behind the bar. I inquired about the barrel to the pub owner. Oi, cost me a small fortune. After old lady Carlisle died. The estate started selling old barrels that they'd been holding on to. I'll pull you a glass if you want. I nodded. He handed me a glass of the ruby liquid. Feeling apprehensive, imagining this wine being barreled by an insane murderer. The wine was velvet on my tongue and warmed my chest. The claret was better than any French claret I had ever had. And it better well have been, because when my bill came, I nearly fell off my seat. The bartender, noticing my shock, remarked, Well, what did you expect? There's only a few barrels left in the entire county. I paid the small fortune and turned in for the night. The next morning, I arrived at the estate. The facade was unchanged from my previous visit. Again, Silas answered the door. All he said was, Drawing room. I said nothing, not even affording him a pleasant smile. It wouldn't do much anyway. I made my way to the drawing room where Cornelia, her uncle, the current Lord Carlyle, Lord Carlyle's mistress, and the estate attorney were gathered. I found it curious that I was named a beneficiary in Aunt Amelia's will, I felt anxious to see what she left to me. The will reading commenced shortly after my arrival, and it was quite standard. Lord Carlyle already owned the estate, so he was left with most of Aunt Amelia's fortunes and priceless artifacts. Aunt Amelia still owned the winery business after her husband died in the 1850s, and the profits were not entailed to the estate. Therefore, She left the remaining barrels of claret that remained unsold and aged for 40 years to Cornelia, so she could sell the wine and live quite comfortably. As for me, I was left with a great number of books from the Carlisle Library. I was very grateful for this generous gift. Fortunately, Lord Carlisle didn't seem displeased by this gift, which may or may not have been Aunt Amelia's to give away. He had no use for them, nor did he understand their value. Do you know how many barrels of wine remain on the estate? I asked, trying to make polite conversation. Judging by how much I paid at the pub for one glass, I would imagine just one barrel alone would be enough to support Cornelia for a number of years. There were 53 barrels when Granny died, she responded. My uncle sold one to the tavern in town and took one for himself in London, so 51 remain in my name. 
They are all in the cellar if you would like to take a look. Yes, I, I would be interested in seeing the cellar, I said, genuinely curious. We were accompanied by Lord Carlyle, who I could tell seemed just as uncomfortable to be in the house as I was, and his mistress, whose name I believe was Sylvia? We made our way to the cold cellar. It was remarkably well-maintained. The floor was paved stone, and the barrels were well-organized, albeit covered in cobwebs. The most recent vintage is 1855, said Lord Carlyle. Clearly, he had made himself familiar with the wines before it was all given to Cornelia. Let's open one, he said in a jubilant tone. Cornelia rolled her eyes, seeming to hint that Lord Carlyle was a drunk and could not resist her intoxicating inheritance. Nevertheless, Cornelia relented. After all, Lord Carlyle was allowing her to remain on the estate in good faith, and she did not want to make him cross with her. Lord Carlyle reached for the most recent 1855 vintage. With an old crowbar, he rapidly pried the lid off the top of the barrel. Sylvia, who was at Lord Carlyle's side, immediately fainted. The cellar was filled with the most putrid and unearthly smell I have ever come across. Putrid wine, rotting tannins, and death. Cornelia ran out of the room with her hands over her face, and Lord Carlyle stood in shock, white as a ghost, about to faint as well. I did not need to look at the contents of the barrel to know that we had found Madeline Carlyle after 40 years among the claret. Hey there, it's the new year. You've got mood boards and resolutions and work is back in full swing and you don't need any extra stress in your life. And Factors Ready to Eat Meal Delivery takes the stress out of meal planning and sets you up for success in the new year. Skip the grocery stores, prep work, and cooking fatigue. Instead, get chef-crafted, dietitian approved meals delivered right to your door with over 35 meals to choose from per week, including options like keto, calorie smart, vegan plus veggie, and more. Plus over 55 weekly add-ons, you'll have a ton of nutritious and flavorful options to kickstart your resolutions. Forget frantic lunch preps and rush dinners. Factors 2-Minute Meals are your secret weapon in the new year. Fuel up fast with restaurant-quality meals, all delivered right to your door. Factor now offers loads of snack options like breakfast, smoothies, juices, snacks, and more to keep me going no matter what's on the schedule. Skip the overpriced takeout trap. Factor is cheaper and way more delicious than takeout. Get chef-crafted, restaurant-quality meals delivered right to your door. They are ready to heat and eat Eat in just two minutes, which means more time for you. Need a special occasion meal? Gourmet Plus is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easily. When things get hectic, Factor is flexible. Change up your order every week with plans from 4 to 18 meals per week. Or pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Stress less over meal times in the new year. Factors no prep, no mess meals, free up time otherwise spent on shopping, cooking, and cleanup. No more wasting time in the kitchen. Not only does Factor offer fast, simple solutions when I'm too busy to cook, they also help me stay on top of my goals. With offerings like Protein Plus and Keto, I can stay on track. This is definitely going to come in handy for my New Year's goals. Factor has everything I need for a week of flavorful, nutritious eats. In addition to ready-to-eat meals, they have cold-pressed juices, smoothies, energy bites, extra protein, veggie sides, and more to keep me energized during frantic times. Head to factormeals.com slash scareyoutosleep50 and use code scareyoutosleep50 to get 50% off. That's code SCAREYOU2SLEEP50 at factormeals.com. 
As many Scary to Sleep fans know, I've been going through a lot of changes in my life, and one thing I've been doing is getting my finances much more organized, and that includes paring down some of the subscriptions I pay for. It feels like everything is a subscription these days, be it for the gym or streaming services or music, the list goes on and on, and something that has helped me tremendously is rocket money. They not only helped me cancel subscriptions that were a pain to try to do myself. Have you ever tried to deal with some of these companies directly? It's just a headache. Rocket Money also alerts me when the subscriptions I did keep go up in price, giving me the ability to weigh my options and keep those little extras that add up oh so quickly in check. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. I can see all of my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with a tap. I never have to get on the phone with customer service. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. That's rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Rocketmoney.com slash scare you to sleep. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, you can follow on social media at Twitter, Instagram, um, Facebook, all of those at scary to sleep. The Facebook is a group, not a page. So you have to actually go and join and answer a couple questions. They're very easy questions. Um, we love new people. And if you want to just invite some more people, that'd be great too. Uh, it's a really fun page. Uh, Again, if you heard at the top of the show, if you follow me on social media, you'll hear all this, all the news first before anybody else. Um, so yeah, go check out mediums, go check out Margaret's garden, go check out 13. I am just feeling the love this week and spreading it around. Well, I guess one of those shows is my own. So, (laughs) but it had a whole team of people and they deserve your love too. I was just the host. So, you know, I... I am so proud of it. Again, we're going to talk about it more later. I have been told that I have something special that I get to show you guys. So that'll be fun. Um, I'm so excited. Um, I made, let's see, baking this week real quick. I made uh, strawberry cream cheese turnovers um, for my anniversary. And that was fun. And yeah, I'm not going to talk too much. You've heard from me so much this week. I know that I have gone on and on. So I love you. Go get some sleep, sweet dreams.